Hi, everyone. Welcome to Entrepreneurship by Design with Dr. C. I'm so glad you're here today because I have such an incredible guest with us, Marla Green. Marla is the owner of Educatrix Advanced Practice Seminars, LLC. Her company conducts biannual continuing education conferences for nurse practitioners. CE credits are necessary for practitioners to obtain and maintain national certification and state licensures. Having received her master's degree from the University of Alabama in Huntsville in 2011, she is nationally accredited family practice nurse practitioner with the American Nurses Credentialing Center. The majority of her nursing and nurse practitioner career was spent taking care of oncology patients. Having been both a provider and patient, Marla is passionate about patient advocacy and healthcare equity. She loves sharing her experience and expertise to assist and uplift others. She currently resides in Georgia with her nine-year-old son, mother, and golden doodle, Xander. And thank you so much for being here today, Marla. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I would love for you to just dive into your journey, how you got here today, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. C. It's such a pleasure. Um, wow, my journey. Um, you know, I always wanted to be a nurse, just always. And so everything that I did um, from really high school on, you know, fed that journey, you know, to be a nurse. So I um, I worked in medical settings. Um, I got a actually in high school, I worked as a candy striper and I kind of laugh because people don't really know what candy stripers are anymore. Um, that really dates me. You know, people go like, what's a candy striper? <laughs> you know, we, we filled water pitchers and passed out magazines and, you know, help nurses um, in nursing homes. That's, you know, what a candy striper was back in the day. But um, I also um, worked um, in front desk for a medical office. i done birth certificates. Um, I've done a lot of things, you know, in the medical world, worked for Ask a Nurse. Um, and then I was finally able to go to nursing school. And so I got my um, associate's degree, went, worked and then did my bachelor's degree while I was working and then did travel nursing for a little while. And while I was doing travel nursing, I got real inspired to be a nurse practitioner which is hilarious because I was like, I'm not going to be a nurse practitioner. I don't need to go back and do my master's. You know, I'm content to just, you know, get my bachelor's and which is, I said, I'm content to just get an associate's when, you know, I was done with school with my associates. So you see the pattern there. <laughs> I'm done with school. I don't need to go back. So um, anyway, I went back and got my master's degree um, and then um, continued to work in oncology. That is something I forgot is that I was an oncology nurse. And that's funny too, because I always swore I'm not going to be an oncology. And, you know, we make plans and God laughs. So was in oncology and um, continued to be in oncology after I got my master's degree. So one day I was moving into a brand new house. We were moving out of our apartment into a house. We, we lived in Georgia by then. My son was about three or four three, I think two or three. Um, it was 2015 and, um, it's a beautiful day. And I remember it was sunny and I had just gotten my hair done. Um, and I was drinking my favorite drink from Taco Bell, which is Baja Blast. I love Baja Blast from Taco Bell. <laughs> so I remember enjoying the day thinking about, you know, the stuff that I was going to move and I was in the right lane and we were in stop and go traffic. If you've ever been in Atlanta, you know that 75 at any time of the day can, you know, be in stop and go traffic. So we had stopped and there was an 18 wheeler behind me and the left lane, you know, was kind of still going. And so the left lane um, had picked up. And so he was trying to move into the left lane and didn't realize we had stopped. And so he hit me. And so that was a four car accident. And, you know, fast forward a little bit, I walked away from the accident, you know, I didn't realize I was hurt as bad as I was, as people often do. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, um, down the road, it was determined I couldn't go back to work. So I filed for disability. And, you know, I basically went from running around a busy oncology office to being disabled overnight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a single mom. I'm disabled. And, you know, I was like, you know, 
what do you mean I can't go back to work? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, since I was little, I'm supposed to be a nurse. Like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So after being depressed and moping for a little while, I picked myself up and found a job health coaching. And I was like, well, what, you know, what in the world is this? You know, trying to get back in the groove. And when I talked to the health coach, you know, she was really sweet about it. She, she was just like, cause I thought health coaching was about food, right? Mm -hmm. That's what most people think. Health coaching is about Mm -hmm. food. You know, you just Mm -hmm. lose a little bit of weight, change your diet and poof, you know, you'll be better, but it's not, it's Mm -hmm. so much more. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found out, right. It's so much more. And that's what I found out about personal development and, you know, it kind of changed my life. And, you know, I realized I had two choices. Either I could stay where I was and be like, uh, my life is over (laughs) or I could, you know, get up and learn to live Mm -hmm. with the pain. And so that's what I did. And so I did health coaching for a little while, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so then I had an opportunity to um, take over a continuing education business. And so I was like, hmm, continuing education. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was like, that gets me back in the room with my peers. You know, um, I get to influence patient care, but indirectly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had found out how much being a patient was not the thing. Like it was just not fun. Right. And, you know, I didn't realize how vulnerable and how frustrating being a patient could be. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I could show providers how, you know, being a patient kind of sucks, you know, just to be transparent, you know, yes. it sucks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how we need to be more compassionate, you know, towards patients. And yeah, I understand that we have, you know, 30 something patients to go through and, you know, because of our quotas and insurance and, you know, we have to hop, but on the other hand, you know, that's still a person and they need us too. And, you know, that needs to be emphasized in education. That's something that, that I've never heard of, you know, in all the CEs. And so I was like, yeah, I can do that. And so the rest is pretty much history. That's what I've been doing for the past 18 months is trying to grow my continuing education business. Mm-hmm. I love it. And, you know, I think you said something so important because I do agree, like it, it's important to really understand maybe where the patient's coming from. I know like when I was in psychology, it was like on the other side, they're like, well, to be a good therapist, you need to like experience a therapist and understand what it feels like to be on that other side. And of course, nobody wants to be a patient, um, just to preface that. But I think just having that compassion and understanding of maybe where that person's coming from, because I can't imagine how stressful it can be when you're working with 30 clients, maybe on the floor or patients and having to attend to everybody, but realizing it is that person and how interesting that you were able to really see it on the other side and see that there was a gap happening and fill that gap and be able to have this education business, essentially of continuing education given to you to start building on your own as well. And what was that process like once you started and what did that look like? Um, you know, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. You know, I think it was incredible, um, you know, because it really did change my life. I mean, you know, it, the whole, you know, at the time, of course, I wasn't thankful for the accident. I wasn't like, you know, oh, I'm so glad this is happening to me, right? I thought my life was over, right? right? But, you know, at this point, seven years later, whatever, 10 years later, I don't know, I I can't keep track. Um, You know, I'm like, okay, I, I get that that happened for a reason. Whatever reason it was, I get that it happened for a reason. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it is incredible, A, that I'm still here. Yes. And B, that, um, you know, it's been turned around to something positive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yes, I was so thankful to be chosen to continue on um, these people's legacy. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, the deal fell apart. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) and um so that was kind of another like uh, you know because I was like wait a minute 
this is something that I really wanted to do and I really liked. And then they decided they wanted their business back. I was like, what, what do you mean? Like, that wasn't covered in Entrepreneur 101 in, you know, the glamorous <laughs> TV version where, right. you know, you start your own business and things just kind of flow. Like, what happened to that version? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, when that happened, I was pretty devastated. But in my opinion, mm -hmm. I was too far vested by that point. And I had more to lose by walking away than, you know, than me just bootstrapping it and being like, you know, I'm gonna make this work. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not ready to walk away. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that wasn't the first business that, you know, I had tried um, in the spirit of transparency for your viewers. Um, you know, I had tried some um, MLMs mm -hmm. and it just, it wasn't for me. And so, you know, this was the first like true I don't want to call MLMs not business, but I'm just saying business from scratch, you know, that I had tried to do. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, no, you know, I, I was like, I can still have a continuing education company um, and, and not be a competitor of this, of these people who decided to keep their education company. Like we don't have to be enemies just because this business still didn't go through. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was business. And you decided, you know, to keep your company. Okay, well, great. <laughs> I'm going to continue to do what I was going to do in the first place. I'm just going to go open up my own continuing education company. Is it going to be harder? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just feel like this is what I need to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's what I've been doing. I mean, sure, it's been harder, but oh, well. <laughs> Choose your heart, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well said. You know, it's so true. And I love that you were able to like be very transparent on you, this wasn't your first business venture that you started. And this was maybe the first that you started from scratch of understanding, okay, well, the deal fell through. And that's part of business. It's not personal, it's business, but being able to utilize your skill sets and still build something that's wonderful and great and going to be helping so many individuals, especially in particular in the nursing field and nurse practitioners of understanding how to connect with their patients. You can build it how you want to. And that's the whole point, right? Like when we go down this road, we don't want to work for someone else sometimes because we want to use our creativity and build what makes sense for us, but also because we have our unique aspects of things and how we go about things. So you can have two companies that are both about continuing education, but how you deliver it is so different. So different. Exactly. Exactly. And because, you know, my vision of a continuing education company is, um, you know, showing people up to date stuff, you know, stuff that's exciting, delivering it in an exciting way. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the thing that I hate about or always hated about doing continuing education is going in here and that speaker that sounded like the peanuts teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. You, know, and you end up sleeping yeah. like it's an orientation more than, you know, you learn anything. And the only reason why you went was to say you got your continuing education credits you know, and that was it, right? Maybe you met a person or two, but maybe you didn't because there were 2,500 people that you didn't know and you were just another dot in the sea of people, <laughs> you know? I mean, who knows? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and that wasn't the vision, you know, of, of the people, you know, that that I left and mm -hmm. or, or that chose to keep their business. I shouldn't say that I left. So, um like you said, I mean, you know, th th there's room for, for other ideas. So, you know, without us, yeah. you know, beating each other up and going, no, my client, <laughs> my client. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's just interesting because like I, I, for the same concept, when I had to go to like continuing education for psychology, like they wouldn't be very exciting. The information was wonderful and I appreciated it. But even I was telling you before, I do for the prison system in California, the therapist, I'll do like trainings here and there. And I try to make them as lively as possible because I know what it feels like to be on the other side. And I don't want people falling asleep on me, <laughs> to be quite honest. Like I do it all virtual, but it's just interesting. And you're right. There's room for everybody. And it's how you go about it and making it with relevant information. And it's not like the peanuts and like, 
<laughs> so I totally get it. <laughs> and I appreciate that. And I love what you're building. And I'm just so curious. So even though like it started differently than now it, where it is now, what has been maybe some of the obstacles you've faced in building the continuing education? Um, obstacles. Um, one is, you know, yes, I'm better, but I'm still not like functional, like the regular person. So, I mean, part of the reason why I chose to start my own business was because I couldn't be consistent in a regular job. Right. But I still needed income. Um, So, you know, my physical health is sometimes an obstacle, right? Um, Because, you know, sometimes I want to do stuff and my body's like, oh, not today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, that's a problem. I mean, even though, you know, most of the stuff I can do for my bed, I mean, that doesn't keep the pain from coming, right? Um, Because, you know, I know that I look fine. You know, it's one of those invisible disabilities, which is a new word that I, you know, have learned in the past couple of months. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm in pain all the time. I have a stimulator in my back that tricks my brain into thinking that I'm not hurting. But that doesn't mean I'm never in pain. I mean, that just means that my pain is less than it would be if I didn't have my stimulator, okay. right? Because I still have to take medication, um, you know, and it still hurts. And so it's just like, what kind of degree of pain can I deal with, right? And still function. Mm -hmm. Um, And then another obstacle has been money. Um, It's been so interesting to me that people talk about people getting off government assistance, disability, and other things. However, there are very, there are very few programs out there that are designed to help people like me you know, people, single moms on disability who want to get off disability. Um, Very few, you know, and then um, because of my situation, you know, the fact that, you know, I went from making six figures to being on disability. And, you know, when that happens, you know, for people who aren't familiar, you know, with the system, it's not like, you know, you just go from making money to, oh yeah, long-term disability kicks right in. No, that that doesn't happen, right? It's, you know, you're making money and then all of a sudden you're not for a period of time (laughs) Mm -hmm. until disability kicks in, right? Long-term disability, if you have it through your job. And then, you know, well, actually, I'm sorry, first short-term disability and then, you know, Mm long-term disability. But then when long-term disability kicks in, it's like there's some person, unnamed person on the other end of the phone that's deciding whether or not you get your long-term disability. You know, you're taking paperwork back and forth to your doctor and it's not guaranteed steady money. It's some unnamed person on the other end of the phone deciding whether or not you get your money every, I don't know, two weeks, one week. I I don't remember. It's been, you know, it's been a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's very stressful. And then it's, you know, it's only 66% of your income, you know, that you were used to before. So anything that you had in reserves, unless, you know, you had like the whole lot in reserves, Mm -hmm. you know, you burn through pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, fine, you have this long-term disability, but again, it's 66% of your income. So if your house isn't paid off, or if you, you know, you weren't living on 50% of your income, then you're, you know, pretty done for, (laughs) you know, you're going to go from, you know, an 800 credit score to something that does not look anything like 800, Mm -hmm. something that looks like a number that you never knew was possible like I did. I didn't know that number was even possible. So, you know, now, you know, the banks don't want to touch me. Mm -hmm. You know, I I get that. You Mm -hmm. know, I've applied for, you know, a lot of grants, but I still haven't gotten one. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm not trying to better my situation. Like a lot of people like to, you know, I hear people like on the news or, you know, 
on social media or, you know, wherever, you know, talking about people not trying to better their situation. And maybe that's true for some people, but there are people out there that are trying to better their situation who are trying to grow a business and stuff, but there aren't very many resources out there for us. Okay. And it's been a big obstacle. Yeah. And it sounds like a huge obstacle. And I appreciate the transparency too, because I don't think it is talked about enough because you're right on the news or social media. It will say, oh, well, no one's working towards it or whatever it is, but you don't know anyone's true story of what's happening because they, like you, have been working towards it, making sure that you have all the things in place, but you're limited because of the resources in some capacities. Like you were mentioning a few years ago, you didn't have the resources. It's not something that's talked about, or this is what you need to do, or what you said, on the other end of the phone, somebody is deciding your future, basically, financially. In right. that and, I mean, and nobody wants to go out in public and talk about how they don't have money, right? I right. mean, it's not... Yeah, I mean, yeah no, it's not like, hey, hey. Hi, hey, hey. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because for a long time, I was super embarrassed about it. I mean, I, you know, I was, and then I had to get over it because I was like, well, nobody talks about it. It's very present. And I'm not the only one this has happened to, no. No. you know, I'm not, I, you yeah. know, I remember that, you know, I was so embarrassed because um, a policeman came to my door to deliver something that some creditor, you know, had for some reason. And I was so embarrassed because like, oh my goodness, you know, my son saw that some creditor came to my door. Mm -hmm. He was like three or four, you know, he's mm -hmm. never going to remember. He's mm -hmm. 10 now, never said anything about it. But, you know, I mean, we have to stop you know, I, I don't know, being so judgmental of other people's situations so that other people can feel free to share these things that are considered so taboo, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, because maybe then we can normalize these kind of conversations, you know, about finances, about, you know, other things that, you know, are considered things that people don't want to talk about and don't want to open up to other people too. Absolutely. And you're right. It's normalizing the conversation because the more we talk about something, the more people don't feel so alone too, or the, the shame or guilt or any other feelings that come up around that because feelings are universal and how we experience them are different. But I think it's when we start actually having the conversation about it, it brings it not this like heavy elephant in the room. It's more mm -hmm. of like, okay, let's minimize that elephant or if I could make it a baby one. And then like, eventually it's not there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know where I got that, but you know, it's I just love like, it. I lo I'm going to use it. Let's make it a baby <laughs> elephant. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like progress. <laughs> a little different, but <laughs> the more we have those conversations, the more it just like makes more sense for people to understand where people are coming from, because you never know what somebody's going through unless it's spoken about and you like, you still don't even know because then internally what's happening. So I think it's just having a little bit like what you were talking about too, with the patients, more compassion, more grace in these situations, these conversations, because you just never know the card that were dealt that person and how can you help or assist or give resources or anything. But the more the conversations happen, the more something can be done about it. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so outside of the obstacles, because I know you've had success with the continuing education. I know it might've been a bumpy start, but I would love to know maybe one or two success stories you could share with us. Oh man. My biggest success was at my last conference. Um, I didn't have a lot of numbers, um, you know, because of COVID, you know, it was still the end of COVID. It was last October. Um, and it wasn't just me, you know, a lot of people who tried to do medical conferences live did not have numbers. But um, for me, I got my biggest win because um, I had, I just got a lot of compliments. I'm getting chills. <laughs> because, um, you know, this one seasoned nurse said um, in front of, you know, several other people mm -hmm. that it was the best conference he had ever been to. And, um, you know, it was the most engaging conference and he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and he said that um, he didn't even have the amount of coffee that he usually drinks and he still didn't fall asleep. And so, you know, that was like huge for me because again, going back to earlier in our conversation, that's the whole goal, right? Mm -hmm. 
to not have the peanuts teacher. And, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my goodness, I met my goal. And this is, you know, only the second conference. <laughs> so I was just, I was just so excited and happy. And I was like, okay, you know, people get it. You know, it's not just me. So yeah, that was, that has been like my biggest win. Um, let's see what, what else? Um, I guess my other win is just getting to meet people and networking with other people and meeting just these amazing women, mostly Me meeting amazing women that I would never have put myself out there to meet before. Um, that's another thing that I want to change. Um, in healthcare, or at least when I was in healthcare as a nurse, you know, you don't really network with other nurses. I mean, you know, like maybe you talk to them at work and it's like, hey, bye. Or maybe, you know, your people at work, but like knowing other people and like getting outside, like your little comfort zone or the people like you might meet at meetings, mm -hmm. you know, you don't really like go outside your comfort zone. And even like when you went to the CE meetings that I remember that I went to, like it wasn't. I wasn't like exchanging numbers with another nurse going, you know, Hey, nice to meet you. Let's exchange numbers. Okay. No, it wasn't like that. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to change that. And maybe, maybe then maybe we would learn to be more welcoming to these baby nurses that are coming in because, you know, we have a really bad reputation. You know, people always say nurses eat their young. And I don't think that that has changed in the past couple of years. You know, I still think it's, nurses eat their young. I just don't think it's talked about as much lately, you know, with all the positive press that nurses have been given because of COVID and, you know, they've been taking care of people. They haven't been talking about it as much, but I'm pretty sure it's still there. Yeah. And so I think that maybe if we networked with each other and like had more positive experiences with each other, instead of keeping to ourselves so much, maybe then that would trickle down and we could welcome the younger generation too, and like mentor them or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm still working it out in my head, but it, we got to do something because yeah. we need them. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I like, I didn't realize that because I'm obviously not in that field, but I think it's just a really good point to bring up of having these networking groups or conferences, but like being able to have people really connect with one another because it can be very overwhelming. Just the stories I've heard from people I personally know that are nurses and how difficult it can be day to day, the hours and if they have families and single moms in particular, but like that I know that are nurses. And I think it's just, it can be very overwhelming from an outsider's perspective, hearing it, I can't imagine actually being in it and having to go through it, but you just keep going. That's like the mentality I have heard. I mean, that's in other fields too. But I think it's understanding how can we make it better for people. And you're right. I, I've heard that expression, like the older nurses like that have been in it for a while, like eat the young. And like, I, I have heard that. And I think it's just changing the conversation again, the more we know, the more we can do better in any capacity, not even just nursing, but in general. So I appreciate that. And you know, when you said about the um, person that was at the conference, that he stayed awake through the whole conference and didn't have as much coffee, I got chills. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing of just the power of the words and what was happening in the conference and what he was learning to really be so engaged because it's like that engagement of understanding they're learning something, but they're getting value attentive to it as well. The power of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, tell I'm telling you, every time I get sad and think I can't do this, I just, I just think about what he said. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I can keep going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, It'll be okay. You know, it will, it will. <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing both those stories. They're amazing. And I think it's just understanding to more conversations. That's what I'm gathering from everything so far is just having the conversations, not making things so taboo and understanding we're all human at the end of the day, how we go about things might be different, but like, how can we make it more inclusive as well versus, you know, Xing people out or not having that community or a safe space to talk about it. With that, I'm so curious because I know continuing education is your wheelhouse. You've been doing it now for a while. What have been some of the things that you've learned of just the conferences you have been put, able to do and just how it's starting to grow? I just, I didn't realize how much 
detail was put into continuing education conferences. You know, I think that before I kind of thought continuing education was just kind of like glorified event planning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, not having ever done continuing education, I just kind of thought, okay, well, you know, you just figure it out, you know, where you're going to have it done and people come and speak and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, I had, I had no idea the minutia that was involved in it. Um, the fact that you have to be um, an accredited approver, you know, like, like mm-hmm. the person who puts it on has to be accredited through, you know, a, a accredited body. And then, you know, they have to hold their speakers to a certain standard. And then, you know, they have to make sure that their speakers don't have a conflict. I mean, it's just, it's a lot that I would have never even imagined before. Mm -hmm. And it's like every conference, I learned something new. Like even before our conversation now, I mean, I was talking to the board of nursing, you know, trying to make sure that I had all my ducks in a row. And I'm like, you know, I just feel like I always learn something new about that. Mm-hmm. So it's just very, it's very interesting. The mm-hmm. The other thing that I've really, really learned about continuing education is that there are so many more fields of nursing than I ever, ever imagined. Hmm. <laughs> um, and mm-hmm. that's, that's why I love doing it because, you know, I love presenting, you know, other topics, other fields of nursing, you know, to people you know, so maybe they'll be a little bit less burnout. Maybe, you know, somebody all like could be like, okay, I feel encouraged because, you know, I can go do forensic nursing instead of being stuck doing OBGYN or, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know that there's just so many other things to do. It's just, it's kind of mind blowing. And especially with all this AI stuff, Mm. it's, it's just amazing. Um, Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. I, I believe it. And I, I'm really curious because I know you just mentioned that there's a lot of different like aspects of nursing and different fields that you can really be in within the nursing field. What were maybe a few that surprised you that was like part of nursing? I'm just curious. I think the new stuff that they're coming out with mm. now, um, because I know last year before chat B- GPT got mm-hmm. really popular, maybe it was a little bit before last year, I was, I was looking at maybe having somebody come and talk about the word wasn't AI that I had in my mind. It was more like machine, like technology in nursing, Mm because I didn't really know the word AI. Um, And so now that it's really progressed or maybe in the forefront so much, you know, in the last few months, um, you know, now you're hearing so much, so much more about AI and nursing. Um, you know, like, you know, somebody just wrote a book about AI and nursing and, you know, there's just been a lot of webinars about AI and nursing. And so it's, it's just going to be interesting how things progress from here. You know, I mean, like one of the fears is, oh, they're going to take our jobs and, you know, but I just can't see how, how AI would ever, you know, overtake nursing. I just can't, you can't, trade, you know, that human touch and compassion and things that nurses do. I mean, and, and even, and I mean, we've been using robotics, like in surgery, you know, doctors have been using robotics and surgery and stuff for years. And, you know, nobody's talked about robotics taking over what surgeons do. So I don't, I mean, maybe it would enhance what we do, but I mean, you know, like we, that's another thing. Yeah. Like we use it with like getting out medications and, you know, and we still have overrides for that because the, the machines inevitably fail. So yeah, they're not taking our jobs. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> I feel like it's that human touch, right? We joked about this back when I was practicing therapy. They're like, are they going to take over our jobs as therapists? I mean, I'm no longer in it, but still that human connection, being able to help a patient that's in dire, like crisis, emotionally, physically, whatever it can be. I think it, like what you mentioned, it can enhance things, but I don't think it would take over. That's just my opinion, my thought. And I think it's, there's a lot more to it, the depth of it, because you can't replace that connection. 
community yeah. and like the relationship building, you know? Right, the relationship building. Exactly. Yeah. AI just can't do that yet. I mean, we'll see how it works, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. <laughs> As I'm saying, thinking about it. <laughs> um, but anyway. I appreciate you sharing that. And I would love to know what are maybe two or three tips on this journey that you've learned of entrepreneurship? I know you've been, you've had other businesses prior, but what has been really like stands out to you that would be beneficial for others to hear? Have an attorney, um, Mm. you know, have a relationship with an attorney. That's like the number one thing that I learned (laughs) Mm. with my um, situation with, with buying the business. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't have a relationship with an attorney and, and, and again, you know, not because I wanted to sue somebody to, you know, make them hurt or anything, right. um, you know, just to know my rights and, you know, it's business, it, you know, it wasn't personal. Mm-hmm. So, um, that would be the, that would be on my list, you know, mm-hmm. if I was starting another business, just to have a relationship with an attorney, it's just a good thing to do. And I mean, not just for that situation, but also like for contracts and stuff that you draw up. Like I have a lot of um, contracted employees, um, 1099 employees. And so, you know, I've drawn up contracts, but, you know, I don't, you know, are they good contracts? Are they okay contracts? You know, like what? So, you know, you just don't want to leave yourself open to litigation. Um, You know, you hope that, you know, people are going to be good, but, you know, you never know you know, it happens. Um, and then the other thing, um, that I would advise people to do is, um, (laughs) I'm laughing because it's, it's not my favorite part, but, um, to write a business plan and I hate business plans. I do. I, I can't stand them. Um, yeah, I, I, but to write a business plan because, and, and, and surely it's not for everybody. You know, I'm not going to say it's for everybody. I'm just going to say that I wish I would have written some semblance of a business plan to begin with. Um, you know, it didn't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be a 12, 15, 25 page business plan, even like the one page business plans, you know, are okay. Just so you have an idea of what you want to do and where you're going, mm-hmm. you know, just some kind of idea. So you know, that you have it like on paper. And so like that, like you can remind yourself, of course, it's going to change like 50 million different times, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but just like a map, you know, yeah, yeah, I can give new appreciations to maps Hmm. instead of GPSs. Just, I mean, you know, just so you can, you know, know where you're going, because, you know, when I started my CE company, it was, you know, oh, I thought I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was off the top of my head, you know, seat of my pants. And I had looked up some, some things and, you know, I had some of it, right. But I wish I would have had a business plan because I probably would have, you know, done a little bit more right than the little planning that I did do. So those are my two tips, attorney business plan. I, I like those. I appreciate both of those, especially because we don't really talk about like having an attorney. And I think that is a really key aspect. Like, I mean, when I've asked for tips and whatnot, um, that's not one of the top tips I get. And it's interesting because everyone has one, but we don't talk about it. I feel like we just talked a lot of taboo stuff today. Right? <laughs> I appreciate it. I really do. I think it's empowering, but having that attorney, because you just want your ducks in a row, you want to make sure everything's like above board in that regard. And I think that's important. And also the business plan, it can look so different too. And you're right. Like how you start is not how it's going to evolve, but it gives you that map and you twist and turn and go up and down and all over the place in that process. But it gives you that clear vision of, okay, it's, this is where I want to be, but the how will change. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well said. So with all of those tips and everything you've shared today, I would love to know, Marla, where can people find you, find your ed- continuing education? We're going to link everything below. Yeah, they can find me on my website, which is Educatrix Seminars. It's E-D-U-C as in cat, A-T-R-I-X as in x-ray, and then seminars with an S on the end, dot com or um, on social media platforms at Educatrix, A as an Apple, P as in Paul, S as in Sam. And that's it. Oh, and in October, we're having our big seminar in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, awesome. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And definitely give me the link for the conference if people can just click on it and 
sign right up. Um, but thank you so much, Marla, for coming on, sharing your journey with us, being so transparent and honest. I so appreciate it. I know everyone listening does as well. And make sure to like, subscribe, comment below. What was the biggest takeaway from Marla today? And we will see you on the next episode.